Welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, a punk take on a science podcast about everything deep sea. Hi, I'm Stacy, a citizen scientist and a huge fan of the deep sea. I wrote in and true to his word, Alan gave me a job introducing the podcast. Near my hometown in California, off the Monterey Peninsula, scientists have been racing to name new species of the deep sea. One of my favorite names is the squat lobster, Monodopsis gurgis. Haven't heard of them? Then you don't know squat. I'm Stacy, and they pay me in stickers. All right, and um, thank you, Stacey. That was a wonderful job. Uh, officially, you are the employee of the month. Unfortunately, though, you're also fired. Tom, you've got your job back again. Hey, it comes and goes, but I'm back. Well, as I say, I'm a man of my word. She asked for a job. I gave her a job. I didn't tell her that it was only about two minutes long, but, you know, we'll pay her in stickers. Yeah, six whole stickers. Anyone else wants a job, just write in. <laughs> Thank you, Stacey. Actually, talking of, of stickers, we have set up a Patreon and some affiliate links as ways of hopefully keeping the show going and making it self-sustaining. So if you were feeling generous, we do have a Patreon, which is sort of our tip jar. There are some little rewards for doing that. Um, so show that we're grateful and if you don't have any money to spare but you do have a bit of time there are also affiliate links now so you'll find those in the in the show notes at the end we, we're going to try and make any advertising as low impact as possible so that is it that is all i'm going to say on the matter and people can leave pints right well we'll convert money into goods and services which is pints yes excellent essentially the whole show runs on pints yep. that's our internal currency am i expected to pay into this by the way no i'd say you probably pay with your time oh okay good right <laughs> for you're in debt for invoice you yeah well we're on episode 34 now that's quite a lot of pains it is i wonder what our day rate is anyway thank you stacy so alan how are you doing i'm all right it's been a busy week yes it has you've been doing the rounds do you want me to elaborate on that well just before we sort of get into that you know i, I, I just want to share something sort of personal about my own career and you know being part of the team that that discovered and went on to describe that the world's deepest fish is, is really something I, I hang my hat on and, and props up my, my whole career. And, and if I'm honest, my sort of self-worth. And I, I don't know what I'd do if somebody found a, a deeper fish and it was a different species. I, I, I don't know how it could go on. Yeah. Anyway, what how's your week been? I found the deepest fish in the world, Tom. Oh, it's the same one though, right? It's the same one? Uh, no, no, it's not. Oh. It's a different one. Oh, is it much deeper? Oh, it wouldn't go beyond the hypothetical limit, though, would it? Wouldn't go beyond uh, 8,200 meters, would it? Yeah, it does, actually, yeah. Oh, everything I believe is crumbling. To be fair, there was some wiggle room in that. It was 8,200 to 8,400, but yeah, found the deepest fish in the world. Found it ages ago, actually. Just never told anybody. We've been sitting on it for ages. Caught the deepest fish in the world as well, but we knew where they are. So we caught two fish from 8,022 meters, which is pretty cool. Wow. The deepest fish is now 8,336, a species of Pseudoloparis. But genetically, they're also close together that it's still looking a bit iffy if your snailfish and this snailfish and the Japanese snailfish are actually all the same thing. It's really hard to do genetics on snailfish. They uh, they don't play nice. No, they don't. So Anyway, so yeah, it's been a busy week doing that. Uh, it's not what I plan to do. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, it was good though. Got decent coverage. People seem to like a good little snail fish story from time to time. And lovely footage. That looked great. Oh yeah, that's only half of it. There's like, there's like tens of hours of this stuff. Amazing. I do love that the world's deepest fish is really damn cute. It looks like a sock puppet. It's kind of naked mole rat. It's kind of sock puppet, but it's got that like big squidgy face and that sort of cheeky smile. Ah, I love them. They're great. It would be terrifying if it was massive. Yeah, it probably would. Probably would. About the size of a shoe is kind of a cute size. Yeah. But yeah. If it was seven feet long, it probably would be terrifying. Yeah, well, there you go. In amongst all of this shenanigans and jet setting, you also told me you wanted to chat about an old passage you found in an old book. An old book came across my path. It's called Modern Science. Uh, sorry, the series is called Modern Science, and this particular edition is called The Fauna of the Deep Sea, and it was written in 1893. Jeez. And it's written by Sidney Hickson, and it's quite interesting. There's a bit at the, the start where he's writing the preface, and he's, he's talking about, he starts off saying, the time may come when there will be no portion of Earth's surface that has not been surveyed and explored by man. And it says, the bottom of the deep sea is still quite recently one of these terra incognita. It was regarded by most persons when it entered into their minds to consider it a all, as one of those regions about which we do not know anything, never shall know anything, and do not want to know anything. Which I thought was a bit harsh. It's quite poetic. And then he, he goes on this bit, it's a really cool bit here, he talks about, we may be able to plant the Union Jack on the summit of Mount Everest, we may drag our sledges to the South Pole, and we may someday be able to travel with ease and safety to the Great Sahara, but we cannot conceive that it will ever be possible for us to invent a diving bell that will take a party of explorers to a depth of three and a half miles of water. 
Yeah, so in 93, this guy had all but given up. He's basically said, nah, it's too hard. But then, because this was working on something else, it's quite a lot of old things, came across this paper in Science from 1901, and it's written by a guy called C.C. Nutting, and it's a book review of a German book on the deep sea. And it's pretty hardcore. <laughs> People don't talk with this honesty anymore. But the first <laughs> line of his book review is, while it can hardly be claimed that this work is a distinct addition to our knowledge of deep sea life, it nevertheless serves as an important purpose in presenting a compact resume of more notable facts relating to the animals of the deep. So basically saying this is nothing new, not that good, but, you know, books are books. But weirdly, this is the bit that caught my attention, right? And hear me out, you've got to hear this to the very end before the big reveal of why this is bizarre. Because the discussion of the physical conditions of the deep sea includes the presentation of the more important facts regarding temperature, but presents to greater length the matter of pressure. The author estimates that the total pressure exerted on a human body if sunk to a depth of 4,000 metres would equal the weight of 10 loaded freight trains each each consisting of an engine, tender and 32 cars. The American reader should remember, however, that these are continental trains and not American trains. Wow. <laughs> it's like 32 train cars. Oh, American ones. Oh, they're just lightweight aluminium rubbish. I can take 32 of those. <laughs> yeah, those <laughs> tiny European trains. It's weird how he's decided to actually say, you know, when we talk about 32 trains crushing down on you, these are continental ones, all right? None of your American rubbish. As if, as if that makes any difference when you're trying to hold up 32 trains. <laughs> That's so weird. So peculiar, yeah. Just decided to be massively unimpressed. Yeah, he goes he goes on to basically accuse the guy of plagiarising some of his work and says it's all rubbish and at the end says actually it's a pretty good book. <laughs> wow, I miss drunken reviews. That's what it's like. He imagines <laughs> just the old boy with a cravat and a pipe and the whiskey just bashing away this review. Ah. Better remind the Americans that we're not talking about their old lightweight trains. We're talking about good old British trains. Amazing. Very weird. Yeah, old literature's brilliant. It's so much more entertaining than the new stuff. Old science writing is like poetic. Some yeah. of the old like Challenger reports and the Galafia reports, there it's poetry. It's really good. So what's your uh, song of the month, song of the episode? Uh, it's, it's probably showing my age, but if anyone remembers the old Adult Swim show, the Metalocalypse, the parody metal band Death Clock. For some reason, I don't. I think they've released an album, and so some of the old wonderful tracks have been coming up. And so I went for Go Into the Water, Ooh. which was part of their album, which was dedicated to fish, because fishes have no good metals to be listening to. So it was an untapped market. So they released an album specifically for fish in the show. It's a whole parody thing. I think you'd enjoy it, actually, Alan. I might have to send it your way. I don't know if you've ever seen right. any metal clips, but it's just about an over-the-top metal band. You can see that they're inspired by a few actual existing metal bands, but they're as powerful as a, a single country because they're just so wealthy. Good. Then there's this weird prophecy related to them as bringing about the end of the world. It's it's a mental show, but uh, yeah. Go Into the Water by Death Clock will be my track of the month. I know two other things that go in the water. <laughs> Only two. Only two. Well, I can think of two offhand. One is a, a goblin shark, and the other one is a plastic kid's toy. And and how do they relate? And how has this caused a bit of scandal on science Twitter? I read the story as citizen science. Someone had taken a picture of what they thought was a, a juvenile goblin shark somewhere in the Mediterranean where they're not known to be, sent it to a bunch of scientists who then published a paper saying this is the first or the expands the geographical range of goblin shark. And then somebody pointed out that it's actually a a plastic toy and juvenile or embryonic goblin shark don't even look like that and then some people more and more people started posting pictures for this plastic toy from ebay and stuff like that and it's like oh <laughs> so i think these guys have been had well it was a it was a photo wasn't it so they didn't have anything else to go on and the, the photo is quite it's quite believable because it's sort of weathered and looks a little bit distorted i'm just surprised you would go as far as writing a paper on it without actually seeing the specimen i think that's probably the the link in that workflow that's let them down it's you know by just trusting a full Photograph seems a bit too trusting, especially a photograph you didn't take that was sort of sent in. Yeah, but no, I, I like the I like the sort of open mindedness of scientists. That does mean that can fall for things sometimes, but we've got to always entertain something, even if it seems very strange because that's how you discover new things. You've got to be open-minded. And I was chatting to you earlier as well about the James Randi fund, which I always thought was interesting. So he was he offered a million dollars to anyone who could prove a pseudoscience sort of scientifically. And the whole premise behind this was that actually a scientist can be kind of gullible, but only because they're, they've got an open mind, basically. They'll always entertain new information. And he said that that actually isn't very good for spotting 
pseudoscience and, and people who are being deliberately misleading. And he was an illusionist and magician. I said, like, that's what you need. That's who can spot a fraud is actually an illusionist, you know, somebody who is a professional fraud. So he set up this fund for a million dollars if he could prove a pseudoscience. And it was it, it wasn't meant to be gotcha. It wasn't meant to sort of attack people who said they could do these things. It was actually meant to give them a platform to prove it. And it was all above board. You know, um, both parties would agree on what the experimental parameters would be, on what success would look like and how it would be measured. And it was actually sort of signed and quite contractual. You know, everyone agreed on it and everyone was happy until, of course, he managed to prove that what they said they could do, they couldn't do. And then, then people started to call foul. But yep, it was never claimed. Nobody ever won. Nobody ever successfully proved their pseudoscience claims. So I thought that was it. That felt a little bit like this. That felt sort of an interesting tangent. So good on folk for going in open-minded. But unfortunately... Sometimes it will be tripped up by doing that. So the moral of that story is next time you go to see, take a magician. Take a magician, yeah. Or certainly if you are not in control of where the data is coming from. I mean, that's something we see a lot in science. You know, the, you'll get a, a series of data and you, I don't know, you, you sort of, you don't want to see what you want to see or apply a cause that you, you want to be there. That's what peer review is good for and having your co-authors, you know. Okay, you've measured this, this is true, but it could also be caused by this. And I think that's a, that's a good sort of power angle for, for peer review is like have you calibrated your sensors could your sensor just be off you know they've always got to look for every other explanation and then be left with your new observation all right i'll take a magician next time or illusionist I don't want to take a magician because you might end up with loads of rabbits and that'd be that'd be really annoying too many rabbits offshore yeah or just lots and lots of balloon dogs <laughs> Here's a little secret. You can make a balloon dog or a giraffe or a sausage dog or a poodle. And it's all just the same thing with different proportions. Is it? They're lying to you. Yeah. Oh, that, oh maybe they are illusionists then. Just make different bits longer. Oh, no. My whole world's just falling apart. I know. As soon as you see that, you can't unsee it. Frauds they are. I know. Oh, well, there goes my uh, Tuesday night balloon blowing club. If it, ever, if it ever comes up, I weirdly taught myself to make balloon animals. I don't know why. It was one bored afternoon. But yeah, I'll, ma I'll make you a balloon dog should we get the opportunity. All right, cool. Appreciate it, mate. Anyway, back to the news. Tell me about polymetallic nodules that can be used to estimate historic climate records. Well, polymetallic nodules can be used to estimate historic climate records. Excellent. What's the next story? <laughs> so research led by Dr. Deng Cheng Long of the Institute of Geology and Geophysics, IGG, in the Chinese Academy of Sciences, CAS. Oh, I love an acronym. And their collaborators have constructed history back to approximately 4.7 million years ago. The study was based on a 36 millimeter diameter polymetallic nodule from the Eastern Pacific, and it was found at just over 5,000 meters deep, and the magnetic scanning was used to provide precise dating results. So it makes sense. These things accrete over huge periods of time, and so they're going to lock away, you know, like the rings of a tree, they're going to lock away the current physical environment as those layers were forming. So there is a lot we could learn actually from studying the nodules. We were actually speaking to a guy about this yesterday, a very knowledgeable person on the subject who happened to be visiting Perth to give a giving a talk on it or something. But what they've done in this paper is they've reconstructed the Antarctic bottom water history. And I said to him, well, you know, the places we go, they're deep enough and certainly a lot of the places we go have the Antarctic bottom water and that's what you need to trigger the growth of the, these things. And he just went, no, you don't. doesn't need to have Antarctic water. And he said, was like, okay, so this is why you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> just like, yeah, I don't know. I thought I knew about nodule formation, but it turns out I don't. It's fascinating though. I, I think we're still learning a lot. Well, his argument was if these nodules have stored the sort of climate history of the earth then the nodule shouldn't be destroyed because they are a record of the history of the earth and that should not be erased so it's a common heritage thing that makes sense a lot of them though you'd only need a few Would you, is this, could you just leave one one behind i don't know having seen some of these nodule fields I, i'm not sure you need that many for uh, climate reconstruction <laughs> No, you do. You need 100 billion. Do you? Okay. Tons and tons and tons of them. Well, on the back of that and mentioning of Antarctic bottom water and circulation, I won't go into this because it's depressing, but listeners to the show will know I've mentioned a few times that one of my big worries is a breakdown of the deep water circulation and how that's happened several times in Earth's past. And there's a few new studies out, one in particular in the last week, that says that that's appears to be happening. We're, we're seeing a slowdown of the deep water circulation, and we've got historic record of what happens when that does happen. So it's bad, and it would be great if we could all band together as a planet and maybe stop that from happening, but I don't know. We've not been doing a great job so far. So I will put some reading in the show notes, but I won't go into that too much because it is, well, 
but it's scary and depressing. I find that a truly inspiring speech there, Tom. Can we all just band together and just stop that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's getting frustrating, but yes, yes. Essentially, can we all just just not just stop it? And we've we've had successes in the past. Look at how we stopped using CFCs. Like that was that was a great sort of banding together of humanity to decide not to do something. Yeah. So we can do it. We can do it. Just stop it. We do like money. We do prioritize that money stuff. Mm. Another little tangent while we're doom and glooming it, was some opinion pieces talking about the vulnerability of subsea cables, which is something we don't think about a lot. And I think we've, we've said this a few times on the show, like the cloud, the internet, we feel like it's up and it's not, it's down. A lot of the separated nations internet is running through subsea cables running through the deep sea but most of them are privately owned you know they're, they're owned by companies they're owned by your your telecom company but they're absolutely crucial for that place's security you know it, fall, it falls into sort of state level security you know that you can cut three cables the width of your wrist and knock out all the internet in australia now that's quite frightening so both as natural disasters or as a as a sort of threat from hostile nations you know that feels like an incredibly vulnerable point so that's that's a, a little bit scary and i don't know how seriously people are taking that i'm sure there are people taking that very seriously out of interest how many square kilometers of deep sea floor have been perturbed by the very cables in which we used to shout about perturbing the deep sea well that's another interesting thing while we're talking very heavily about deep sea mining we're talking on it through cables which have been dredged into the deep sea you know not, not on the same sort of scale but you know they they connect whole nation yeah. I'll, I'll see if i can dig it out and put it in the episode page but there is a map of where all these cables run and they only last for you know a decade or so and then they have to be pulled up and repaired or new cables laid so the deep sea hasn't been untouched we've been burying these cables in it for decades now but weirdly that's not something we talk about i suppose we, we're not willing to give up on the internet the only other little bits and pieces was there's been a really nice whale fall found in antarctica and while reading up on this i realized it was our friend friend of the show cat of deepest lactating human fame so well done cat it's amazing footage of an incredible whale fall pretty extensive as well on the sort of political side of things and hopefully humans Banding together to make good decisions. After 10 years of discussion, the High Seas Treaty has finally been agreed upon, which overall aims to protect the world's oceans, as, as vague as that sounds. And so the one of the main issues was the, the sharing of marine genetic resources, which we touched upon in our bioprospecting episode, actually how difficult that is to be. They are maybe the greatest source of, of future medicines and antibiotics, but it's actually a bit of a legal quagmire with how you actually go about that. So they're biological materials for plants and animals that can benefit society. And that includes industrial processes and food as well as just pharmaceuticals. So as an example, one anti-cancer drug derived from Japanese sea sponge has annual sales at the value of 250 million. Basically, who benefits from that? Who then can receive that money? Who owns something that has just evolved naturally that happens to be within a certain border? So the key points surrounding these talks is the issue of sort of trust and solidarity between developing and developed nations and developing nations offering the sort of tech and resources to search for these new ocean resources, but also sort of helping developing nations who don't yet have that capacity, but also falls within their waters. It's the early stages right now. It is really exciting that this has finally been agreed upon, because like we say, it has been 10 years, but it is still with the lawyers is that right alan it's still being hammered into shape well, i think so it's hard to get details on this right now because i think it has to go and get checked and double checked but everyone seems very happy though there's lots of people applauding and things and smiling so i'll take that as a good sign i did see some people on twitter saying it was all over and on so I don't, I don't know who to believe yeah i think it would be i think everyone agrees it's good the criticism would be well maybe it's not good enough or maybe it's just more words than action but anytime we seem to head in the right direction i i like to cheer for humanity because i worry about it sometimes well yeah you just need to get the world to band together and stop it apparently <laughs> is that gonna be a t-shirt like well, oh yeah. it's all right tom's figured it out tom sold it yeah. we just need to band together and stop it just stop it you could to say the United Nations 10 years easy by just going over there just get get on a plane go over to New York go in and say oi I've got someone to tell you right we're just going to have to all band together here and just stop it alright done fixed yeah you're like a modern day Greta Thunberg <laughs> she, she already out of date <laughs> yeah she's old now she's gone oh I'm pretty sure I'm much older than her <laughs> oh dear but uh, yeah so uh, biological resources marine genetic resources are quite a big thing deep sea is a hotbed of microbial bits and bobs that do interesting things uh, but do you know where a lot, a lot of them live Tom these funky bacteria is it maybe an area that is often overlooked and we should maybe cover as part of our very loosely defined series on deep sea habitats it's overlooked in many ways it's overlooked 
actually visually because it's hard to see in this particular environment and it's overlooked just generally scientifically because it's quite a hard thing to, to do but there is a whole other environment on the planet which is potentially the biggest environment on the planet and it's not the deep sea this is what i have, find hard to get my head around what no i'm not standing for that we always say that it's the biggest habitat on earth i well i don't think it, i don't think it is oh no not according to uh, our guests who's coming up so well we do keep saying on earth maybe we're overlooking the fact earth <laughs> Yeah, because we keep saying on Earth and not in Earth. That's the difference, you see. So That's the spoiler. There it is. Yeah, there it is. So we're going to talk to someone today about deep biosphere, which is what happens when you go down under the seafloor and what kind of weird stuff you find in there, and including oil wells as well. Because, you know, there's, when there's oils on the ground, it's, it's full of all sorts of things. And the conditions that these microbes are surviving under or even thriving on are astronomical compared to it makes the challenge of dupe look easy when you, you see the pressures and the temperatures involved so it's a fascinating bit so we should stop rambling and give somebody a phone who are we going to talk to who are we going to call we're going to call mandy joy from university of georgia she knows all about this stuff Uh, today we have Mandy Joy, who is an American oceanographer and professor at the University of Georgia in the Department of Marine Sciences. And her research has contributed hugely to the field of ocean biogeochemistry and focuses broadly on the relationship between biochemical cycles and microbial ecology. She's also well known for her work studying the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And she's regularly called upon by scientific and policy agencies, as well as the media, for expert commentary on ocean ecology. So, welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast, Mandy. Thanks, Alan. Happy to be here. Great. So while well, your research is obviously very expansive, today I'd like to chat about the deep biosphere. Uh, and that's a term which is not necessarily known by a lot of people. So let's start with definition. What is the deep biosphere? Where is it? And what size is it? So the deep biosphere is an incredibly vast ecosystem. It's easily one of the largest, if not the largest on Earth. It is starting at the seafloor going down to the depths where microbes no longer exist. And that depth varies as a function of temperature and pressure and other environmental factors, but it's a incredibly important habitat for microbes on Earth, and they carry out a lot of important processes that contribute to regulating biogeochemical cycles both globally. So this is everything underneath the seafloor, but we always think of the greatest depths of the oceans and the polar regions hosting, in inverted commas, extreme conditions. But this particular living space is home to things like bacteria and archaea, and they are enduring very extreme conditions. So talk us through like things like oxygen, temperature, and pressure, and how that changes once you get below the seafloor. Sure. So if you're in, you know, a thousand meter water column, that's a hundred bars of pressure. And as you go down into the sediment column, the pressure just increases more and more and more. But then instead of being in just an aqueous fluid, you've got sediments and pore fluid. So that sediment's getting compressed. So it actually compresses the pore fluid, which minimizes the amount of microbial habitat available and the pressure itself stresses the organisms that are there. In addition to, to the inherent stresses of pressure, there are also geothermal gradients that occur in sediments. So the sediments are warming as you go down. So temperature from the top of the ocean surface to the seafloor decreases, right, as you go from top yeah. to bottom. As you go from the seafloor deeper beneath the seafloor, the temperature increases. And that geothermal gradient can be pretty shallow. It can be pretty steep in some places like the Gulf of California or mm. anywhere where there's active um, tectonics. You can actually have hundreds of degrees centigrade you know, within a few hundred meters of the seafloor. So temperature is a stressor. Pressure is a stressor. Oxygen is rapidly consumed in sediments, so they become quickly anaerobic, and anaerobic metabolisms kick in because there's no oxygen, and you've got all kinds of different ecological niches that open up as you move through this cascade of electron acceptors. We breathe oxygen. Microbes can breathe sulfate. They can breathe iron. They can breathe nitrate. They can, they can breathe a number of different electron acceptors you know, compared to us and our, our measly little one that is oxygen. <laughs> and there, you know, deep down beneath the seafloor, there are some fungi as well as bacteria and archaea, but it's really a microbially dominated ecosystem. And the geochemical and sort of geophysical forcing factors 
are quite extreme. Yeah, I mean, it makes my uh, trench look easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, 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 all, it's all relative, I suppose. But I read somewhere that the inhabitants of the deep biosphere are sometimes referred to as intraterrestrials. So please tell me that's a legitimate term and not just one made up by journalists. Because it's brilliant. No, it it, it is actually a, a term that's used to describe these these organisms because yes. they are essentially living within the rocks beneath the, or the sediments yeah. beneath the seafloor surface. Brilliant. There we go. It's a new word. Interterrestrials. Never heard that before. It's great. So the thing that gets me when I ever think about this is what does a day in the life of a deep biosphere bacteria or intraterrestrial look like? Would that be better rephrased as what's a week in the life or a month in the life or a year in the life or a decade in the life? What are the time scales? The time scales vary a lot because there are places in the deep subsurface where the geochemical gradients drive more rapid metabolism. So turnover time might be, you know, months yeah. to years. In other places, the turnover times are as long as 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 millennia. And wow. there are some places that are organic poor. And there, you know, it's like turnover times can be thousands and thousands of years. So it's kind of hard to wrap your head around the fact that a microorganism, when you think about bacteria, you think about an organism that, that can divide every couple of hours, right? Like E. coli yeah, and yeah. the lab itch. But these organisms are growing super slowly and dividing once every few hundred or thousand years. So they are adapted to this sort of life in the slow lane. That really is. It requires a very different approach when you're trying to, say, for example, measure rates of metabolism. Yeah. You know, when we work in shallow sediments, we measure rates over a 24 hour period. And in the deep subsurface, we might we may have to incubate samples for a month to get an itsy bitsy teeny weeny signal that we can measure. <laughs> it's hard to get your head around, isn't it? It's just so slow moving. It really is. Yeah. When people first started doing this, when someone first recognized that they've taken a sample from well beneath the seafloor and found this bacteria in this, I mean, was that a sort of eureka moment? Or was there like a long period of chin scratching going, is this thing viable it's, it's like it's because it's it's moving on such slow time scales it's not like you just found a new fish you went hey there's a fish hey let's study the fish it must be like what is this thing yeah i mean you know we really have the right now it's called the international ocean discovery program the original program was the deep sea drilling project yeah. and you know the ocean discovery program etc lots of different names it changes every 10 years but you know, the U.S. and the Brits and the Japanese and the Chinese and the Germans and the French. It's an international effort to drill in the deep subsurface because it is an incredible undertaking. These cruises are two months long, yeah. these deep sea drilling cruises. And, it, they, you know, you work around the clock like you do on any cruise. But it wasn't until the Peru margin cruise, like 204, where microbiology became a, a big part of the the protocol. Typically, deep sea drilling was aimed at paleoclimate research. And, mm. you know, Bo Barker Jorgensen and, and others had this, this, you know, idea that I think probably it's fair to say a lot of people thought they were crazy that this deep subsurface had to be a really important microbial habitat and what regulates it and what kinds of processes go on and, you know, what are the organisms that live there and are they, you know, the same thing that we see in marine sediments? Or are they just, you know, buried and, and boring? What does it look like? And they, they developed this microbiology program and it was an astonishingly productive cruise. And there have been many, many other legs now that have promoted microbiology efforts. And now it's a standard part of these deep ocean drilling expeditions to have, you know, a contingent of microbiologists on board, not just looking at community composition, but measuring activity and looking at how yeah. these organisms process geochemicals. But it's it's tricky because it's hard enough working in the shallow sediments of the deep sea because you're still working at high pressure if you're in two or 3,000 meters of water or, you know, the bottom of the Mariana's Trench. You want to try and replicate the conditions that these organisms yeah. experience in their natural environment. Well, when you're dealing with the deep subsurface, you've got temperature, you've got pressure, you've got chemical gradients, you've got all these things that you have to consider and vary to really try and assess what's regulating activity. So it becomes quite complicated, but it's really, I mean, it's just incredibly fascinating because sometimes, there are things that are happening that you just didn't expect. 
like I can give you an example, when mm -hmm. in 385 drilled the Gulf of California and the Guaymas Basin, there was a postdoc for my group that was on board the ship and we're still doing experiments here in the lab three years later because they take a long time to do. <laughs> but one of the things that he discovered on board the ship was that carbon monoxide is an incredibly important chemical in the, in the deep biosphere. And that's just something, it's a substrate that microbes can utilize and metabolize in their redox chemistry. But it turns out to be something that is probably important in a lot of places, but go figure, nobody had really looked at it before. So that was that was something new and different. And it was something, we got that data, the CO data, because we were measuring hydrogen and the same GC that we used to, to quantify hydrogen also gives us oh, yeah. carbon monoxide. So we just got it as gravy. And then it turned out <laughs> to be way more interesting than the hydrogen itself. So that brings me on to this next thing. We work in, in very deep waters normally in our day jobs. And we all often get asked, well, what relevance does this have to us? You know, are these things actually providing a measurable ecosystem service? And we were, we're always like, yes, because it's bioturbating the seafloor, it's recycling particular organic carbon coming down and so on and so on. When you get right below the seafloor, what, what are they doing? What is, what is their ecosystem function? What is the real value of, of these microbes at those depths? So when you think about everything in the ocean is connected, it's just connected on different time scales. Mm. And we are biased in the time scale of an expedition or a human existence, or we live in a world where time scales of days to weeks to months to years dominate our thinking right? Yes. These organisms live in an entirely different world. They live in a world where things occur slowly, but very purposefully and driven by a lot of the regulatory agents that processes happen in the pelagic water column, processes happen in the bottom of the lake. Biogeochemistry is biogeochemistry. It doesn't matter where it is. It's just yeah. differences in scales and differences in dynamics. And we have to consider that when we say, okay, is this important or not? Everything is important. It's just important on a different time scale. And in places like whether it's the Gulf of California or the Peru margin or the middle of the Atlantic or the middle of the Pacific, processes are happening that recycle materials that were delivered to the seafloor. And that recycling may take 10,000 years or it may take 200 years. It depends on the conditions at the particular location, you know, organic matter loading, temperature, pressure, chemistry, like yeah. we talked about before. But it's all the same in terms of contributing to sort of modulating Earth's biogeochemical cycles because Biogeochemical cycles don't just happen on one time scale. They happen on a spectrum of scales. And this spectrum yeah. of scales dominates like things that impact climate. You know, if oil was just naturally moving through the seafloor ecosystem from deep reservoirs trickling out of the seafloor, being oxidized in the water column, et cetera, that natural cycle is, you know, a 50 million year time scale. But we short circuit it by drilling for oil and burning fossil fuels. We've turned it into essentially yeah. a 200 year time cycle. Those different time scales, millions of years versus hundreds of years, you have biogeochemical yeah. dynamics that happen on those same sort of time scales, just long and short. The thing about it is that these long time scales, it's a massive area that's represented by these long time scales. So their impact, and they're not all operating on the same time scale, right? It's essentially such a big area and such an, an enormous ecosystem that yes, they have, they, they carry out critical functions for Earth's biogeochemistry because additively they matter, even in the time scale of a few years, because it's such yeah. a huge ecosystem. It's just amazing. It just brings in this whole other element to it of just like extraordinarily long time scales on top of all the other environmental conditions, which are considered to be more extreme than pretty much anything we're familiar with. But out of interest, yeah. how far under the seafloor has bacteria now been found or microbes, shall we say? Two kilometers sub seafloor, viable cells. Two kilometers. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. Is, is, is that a one off, a particular special regional no. place? Or would you expect that to be anywhere? I think that's probably, I mean, that's not the exception. It's the rule. There have been, you know, microbes isolated. You know, there's also a terrestrial drilling program, right? And mm -hmm. there have been a lot of studies in in deep gold mines, four kilometer yeah. plus. And there are ecosystems down there that, that are fueled by the energy drive from the radioisotope water. So wow. 
I love to just sit around spitballing what crazy process could exist under these that or the other conditions. It's like thinking about life on other planets or on the moons yeah. of Saturn or Jupiter. What kinds of metabolisms could exist there and what's the analog on Earth? And that's a really incredibly interesting mental exercise because, you know, when you think about the radiolysis of water, that's like, who, who would have thought of that 10 years ago as a mechanism that could fuel microbial ecosystems? But now we know that this is a really common modality of, of microbial existence. And I think that once you get outside of the box of your ordinary thinking, that's when you can really sort of come up with some potentially interesting, if not crazy, ideas to pursue in, in some of these extreme habitats. Because there's just like the deep sea is is largely unexplored. If you look at a map where we've drilled deep holes and where we've done detailed microbiological work, it's just a handful of sites. We drilled a lot of yeah. holes for paleoclimate. We haven't yeah. drilled a lot of holes for microbiology. And, you know, it's really a frontier. Just like the deep sea is a frontier, the deep biosphere is an incredible frontier that has a lot to teach us about not just life on our planet, but life on other planets. The one the one that got me was I was reading up on this a while back for, for something else we were doing, and it was one of the sort of earlier papers proposing this or at least having the first evidence that there are things living pretty far underneath the seafloor. And there were sentences in there along the lines of, I think we've just doubled the living space of planet Earth. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. And those are, yes. those are no. statements you don't get very often, right? And it's really kind of astonishing. I mean, I, I teach a graduate level microbiology class and we spend a couple of weeks, often more because it's a topic near and dear to my heart, talking about the deep biosphere. And the students during these lectures, I look out and half the time, you know, their jaws are just agape because yeah. they're just astonished. They can't believe that this is part of Earth's habitable space and that it was really only discovered and probed in any kind of detail in the past couple of decades. And in those two decades, we've had this genomics revolution, right? So in the beginning, you know, we were doing most probable number counts and, and stuff like that. And now we've got these yeah. sophisticated genomic tools that we can interrogate these communities. And we don't have to, to isolate them and grow them in the lab. We can reconstruct their genomes on our computers. You know, we can extract yeah. their DNA, sequence the whole community and reconstruct their genomes and look at, you know, all of the potential metabolisms that exist in the community from the comfort of your desk. You don't have to go through the torture of trying to yeah. grow these organisms in the lab because they are really tough to grow. I mean, when you're talking about an organism that has a doubling time of 500 years, I mean, yeah. good Lord. It's a very long undergraduate lab class, isn't it? Right, right. <laughs> so. That would be so, so many PhD students and so, so many PIs. It's just, it's crazy to think about. But that's the beauty of the of the genomics. We can do it without doing that. I love it when you're trying to explain to people that the terrestrial environment on Earth or, or the landmass that we're all familiar with is nothing more than a very small thin veneer <laughs> compared to everything else. It's just, uh, it's, it's bizarre. It's really difficult to get your head around. But go back to the genetic side of things. What is, what's the phylogeny of these strains? Do they form a sort of unique group within the deep biosphere or are they related to oceanic ones or terrestrial ones or what, what, where do they fit? Yes, yes, and yes. So there are some organisms that are unique to the deep biosphere or certainly more common in the deep biosphere, there is some overlap with, you know, shallow sediments and, and deep subsurface sediments. And there's, there's a lot of variability. Mm. It's not like the biogeography of fish populations. There's a lot more isolation in the deep yeah. subsurface because of the timescales that we're talking about. I mean, really, I like to think of it as it's really tectonic timescales that these systems yeah. are turning over, right? It's play tectonics that's driving it. So it doesn't really align with thinking about how, you know, by geographical patterns. Um, but there are methanogens, you know, the methane producing archaea are yep. super important in the deep biosphere. Fermenters are super important and they're fairly common organisms, so to speak, that, that are fermenting organic matter. But they have to have, they have to be able to tolerate, you know, extreme temperatures, extreme pressures, et cetera. And that sort of sets them apart from their, you know, terrestrial or shallow subsurface cousins. But the sweets of the metabolic potential of these communities is fairly similar to what we see in other places. I would say that methane plays a much bigger role in a lot of these habitats because methanogens are tough, you know, archaea yeah. are tough in general, but methanogens are really tough. And I mean that literally because their membranes are tough as nails yeah. and they can withstand high temperatures and high pressures and all kinds of other things that you want to throw at them. They're just tough. 
and methane is a super energy rich compound and they fuel an ecosystem that organisms that consume methane can benefit from the presence of these of these methanogens. But there are bacteria, there are archaea, you know, some of the oldest archaea, the Asgard archaeota, you know, you you've probably heard of these these Loki archaeota, which are believed to be, yeah. you know, ancestral to the eukaryotes. Those were discovered in a deep sample. And the Asgards are just people are just beginning to really probe for these these organisms in deep biosphere samples. In the Gulf of California, Asgards are super, super abundant. And, you know, we're just beginning to sort of tease apart the, the metabolic potential of these of this particular yeah. group of archaea. You know, they've only been known for less than a decade. So we've got a lot to learn about what they're capable of yeah. doing and what their role is in sort of the larger microbial ecosystem. But I'm, I'm quite certain, too, you know, just based on the genomic data, data that we have, there are organisms that exist down there that are that just sort of defy the imagination. If you just sort of look at some of the, you know, the sequencing runs and the metagenome assembled genome, these mags, some of these organisms just they're they're very, very different from other, you know, known organisms. And I think yeah. it's fair to say that the more sequencing we do in the deep biosphere, the more branches that we're going to be adding to the microbial tree of life because the niche space is expansive. There's lots of opportunities energetically to have lifestyles that could lead to development of really novel clades of organisms. And they have plenty of time to evolve. Oh, right? yeah. And, you know, places like the Gulf of California, and I know I've talked about this place a lot because it's a super special place. You know, it's a place, it's a sedimented ridge system. So there's the sediment package mm -hmm. is several hundred meters thick, it's overlying basalt sills and spreading centers. So you've got this interaction of hydrothermalism and high sedimentation. So it's one of the, if not the only place on earth where there's modern day petroleum formation. Most of the petroleum on earth is 65 million years old. You know, it's dinosaur poop being recycled and trees yeah. being recycled. In the Gulf of California, oil is is modern day because it's being generated by hydrothermal thermal processes. But that milieu of organic rich sediments being thermally altered and cracked also gives rise to some of the most diverse and crazy, extreme, exotic microbial populations that you could find anywhere. So that brings me nicely on to my next next point, that within the deep biosphere, there's also another environment going on, and that, that is those hydrocarbon wells, these yep. big reservoirs of, of crude oil. Presumably then, the crude oil under the seafloor is also full of microbial activity as well. Absolutely, yes. Those are, those are not sterile reservoirs. They are chock full of organisms. And are they loosely the same types of communities you see under, shall we say, non-oil but deep biosphere environments, or are they two very separate groups? So that's a really interesting question. So the Gulf of California versus the Gulf of Mexico, we do a lot of work in both places. The Gulf of California is, is high temperature, mm -hmm. hydrocarbon rich, Gulf of Mexico, low temperature, hydrocarbon rich. There is some overlap in terms of the microbial population, but mm -hmm. there is also some differences. And, you know, one of the most striking differences is there, the higher abundance and diversity of Asgards in the Gulf of California compared to the Gulf of Mexico. We have more data in the Gulf of California than we do in the Gulf of Mexico. So that might just be that we... We're, we're data limited, but based on what we've done, it certainly looks like the high temperature communities have more of these, you know, exotic Asgards in them. But there's a lot of, in, in hydrocarbon rich environments, there tends to be, you know, there it's it's anoxic. So there's sulfate reducers, there's denitrifiers, yeah. there's even methanogens. You know, methanogens can do some really crazy things with hydrocarbons. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of fascinating papers that I'm not allowed to talk about because they're not published yet, but they will be published very soon. And I think people will find them quite interesting because, you know, methanogens are typically thought of um, metabolizing simple organic compounds like acetate, methylated sulfides, you know, methylated amines, CO2, et cetera. Yep. But they can, they can go to town on hydrocarbons and do some really interesting things with those hydrocarbons. So what about multicellular life? Go beyond the archaea and the bacteria. What about actually multicellular life, animals themselves? I mean, there, there have been some pretty surprisingly deep specimens found. Are these something you would expect to find more of as, as a, maybe a, perhaps a greater volume of, of material is brought up and had a look at? Or are these just rare deep diving or deep burrowing, deep surviving organisms? I think there's probably more down there than we realize. It's a, absolutely a sampling issue. 
And the way that these deep cores are drilled, any kind of animal that wasn't just perfectly aligned with the drill bit is going to just get annihilated. Yeah. So we would never be able to properly sample them. I mean, when you get box cores, and actually the Germans have have, have these X-ray systems like cat scans on their boats, and you know you can look at deep burrowing fauna yeah, with yeah. these X-rays and these cat scans because they bring these wide bore cores up, and then they just run them through the machine. You can be like, oh, look at that! There's some deep burrowing worms in there. Our shrimp. So I I think it's unfortunate that in the U.S. fleet we don't have any cool toys like that we have some cool toys but we don't have that we don't have that kind of capability yeah. and i think as that kind of capability becomes more available maybe through philanthropy then we can get more yeah. data like that because there's almost certainly critters that that live a lot deeper than we think they do it's just really tough to to sample them without destroying them using the tools and techniques that yeah. we have in hand right now so let's think about when deep biosphere meets deep sea. So you were involved in the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon oil disaster in 2010, I think it was. Yep. Did that trigger some sort of crazy microbial warfare between those that are coming out with the oil into the environment where you have more oceanic-based bacteria? What happens at that point? Yeah, that's a great question. So so when you have a natural hydrocarbon seep, so stepping back for a second away from the oil spill and just considering a natural hydrocarbon seep, yep. the oil is just dribbling out of the sediments. Like It's almost like the sediments are a sponge that's saturated with oil and the oil is less dense and it's just wicking out of the bottom and floating up. In those cases, you do get entrainment of yep. deep subsurface microbes into the shallow sediments and maybe even into the water column. Right. In the case of Deepwater Horizon, the nature of that discharge it was so incredibly violent that you basically had this little riser pipe that was six inches in diameter or thereabouts. And when it got damaged and severed, it was bent. And so the fluids were sort of flying out this crack in the elbow and out of the, the broken off riser. And you were going from this reservoir that was several hundred degrees centigrade into bottom water that was four degrees. And, you know, you've got this overpressurized reservoir and nothing holding it back. So it's just blowing out of there like a torpedo. And the, the organisms that were coming out from the reservoir, we didn't see a whole lot of evidence for that because those organisms probably just got French pressed and shredded as they were coming out because of the nature of the discharge. Yeah. But when that oil and methane, actually, there's a lot of methane coming out too. When the methane and the oil got into the bottom water, you had the formation of different droplet sizes. And so you had all these layers that formed laterally. And we're moving away from the wellhead with the, with the water, just as the physics was mixing the, the system and flowing through the system. So you had these yeah. lateral plumes that you could track them for close to 30 kilometers before they started to sort of fall apart. And wow. in those and those plumes were thick, you know, they yeah. were a couple hundred meters thick. And then there were several layers. The biggest one was centered around 1,100 meters water depth, but there were several others up in the water column. And... It was a microbial party in those plumes because the old degraders started growing yeah. rapidly because they grow pretty fast. They're gamma proteobacteria. Those are the same organisms like E. coli and salmonella, you know, the pathogens that grow really fast in your gut and give you food poisoning. Yeah. These these hydrocarbon degraders are also gamma proteobacteria. They grow really fast. They're flagellated. They have complex sensing abilities, and they can just sort of sniff out an interesting niche and proliferate in it. And so within a few days to 10 days, you started seeing substantial increases in hydrocarbon degradation potential. Methane oxidation took a bit longer. It took about three weeks for that to ramp up. And neither methane oxidation or oil oxidation persisted for very long because the plumes, the physics is very complicated. And the plumes were intact for, you know, about six weeks. Yeah. They started to dissipate and break up after about eight to 10 weeks. And they were pretty much hard to track three months later, almost impossible to track, I think it's fair to say. But that microbial signature of the bloom that happened, and the series of blooms that, that happened during that during that six to eight week period, you could see yeah. that signature for several years in the system. So it took a long time for that biomass to work its way through wow. the system and get sort of stripped out through the grazing loop. 
It's a strange question. Do you think there's a bit of a silver lining to Deepwater Horizon in that we actually learn quite a lot about how the ocean works or the interaction between the ocean and the seafloor? Because you would never be able to, to ever perform an experiment on that scale. But I mean, obviously, it's a big, big tragedy. But at the same time, it's like, well, there must have been a lot of data generated very, very quickly and a very steep learning curve. Yeah, I don't think that there has ever been a natural disaster that we learned so much from as Deepwater Horizon. I mean, the other obvious comparison is climate yeah. change. Will we learn as much as we need to fast enough? I hope so. I mean, we've learned a tremendous amount in the past 30 years, but we still got a long yeah. way to go and we only have seven years left to do it. But with deep water, it taught me a lot as a scientist about doing science and working with other scientists. And one of the things that I think was the most amazing was that at least with, with the team that I worked with, you know, everybody parked their ego at the door because this was a huge problem that needed a solution and the community came together in a powerful way. Yeah, probably very quickly as well. Yeah, we had to. And the resources that were thrown at the system right away but invested in the system, you know, for 10 years and are still being invested through, you know, the restore program. There's 30 years that we have to, to learn more because the majority of the funding was the first, you know, was that 500 million that was spent by the Gulf of Mexico Research in Initiative in the 10 years, you know, after the, after the incident. Yeah. And we learned a tremendous, tremendous amount, but I feel like know enough about the system to ask the real interesting questions. Like, I thought I knew a lot about the Gulf of Mexico when Deepwater happened. I had been working in the system for 15 years. I considered myself an expert. Deepwater taught me just how much I didn't know yeah. about how the system functioned and how the system worked and how it operated and how, you know, the interaction of physics, chemistry, and biology. And it was very humbling to, to realize that, you know, actually you don't know as much as you think you did. And here are the here's the yeah. litany of things that you need to know in order to really understand how the system functions and what makes it tick. So one last question. What's the next stage of this? Where is this research going? Is it just keep looking, keep finding more? Or is there a nice, you know, you mentioned the genomic stuff's taken off. There's obviously this, we haven't really talked about this, it's probably an episode in itself, but how these are yeah. uh, yep. an, a, yeah. analogous for extraterrestrial. Extraterrestrial, interterrestrial, so like, <laughs> is, is that the way it's going or is it, is, is it enough to, to, to continue in on Earth first? So I feel like, you know, there's the, we're at a bit of a crossroads right now. Just a week or two ago, the U.S. National Science Foundation announced that they are not going to replace the Joides Resolution. That's the drilling ship in the, in the U.S. fleet. And, you know, the Chinese Ooh. have drilling ship. But that's really going to impede mm. progress if we don't have a replacement for the JR. And I think there's still discussions underway as to, you know, maybe maybe that will happen. But right now, there's no commitment yeah. for making it happen. And, you know, it's a huge, vibrant community in the U.S. and, and abroad. And we need another ship because we've got a lot of, of work to do. And it's it's really important. And it's, you know, and it's not just paleoclimate. When you think about these organisms living under these extreme conditions, I mean, the first place my mind goes is natural products. These organisms are incredible resources for antibiotics, antivirals, yeah. potentially antifungals, all kinds of interesting natural products, treatments for diseases, you name it. I mean, there's just, there's got to be effort put towards looking at these communities. And now we can do that with the metagenomes. We don't need isolates. Isolates are nice to have. But we can actually mine metagenomes for potential antibiotics, antivirals, yeah. et cetera, natural products of various sorts. So we can use those data to advance humanity in ways that weren't really imaginable even five years ago. But I don't think that's you know all there is to it. You mentioned life away from Earth. The deep biosphere is is an obvious analog for looking at weird metabolisms and organisms that we might find, you know, in another planet. I mean, the radiolysis of water example that I gave before, that's a that's a really interesting, wacky metabolism that could certainly be important on extrasolar planets and other worldly habitats. 
So yeah. I really wish that NASA would get into this game because there's an obvious, you know, not just Mars, but you name it, there's, yeah. there's lots of potential targets out there for which the deep sea and, and the deep biosphere are good analogs. So I wish there was a way that NASA could pick up the tab to fund some of this sort of work because NSF is, they provide an incredible amount of research funding for this community, but I think the community would grow a lot more if there were more resources available and NASA just seems like, you know, an obvious place to pursue, you know, to go for that kind of work. And I really feel like this is an international community. Yeah. Every single drilling expedition, the science party is, it's got representatives from all over the place. And it's not just old farts. It's a lot of young students. It's a lot of graduate students, a lot yeah. of postdocs, you know, it just, it spans the spectrum. It's a wonderful community. And I feel like, you know, we're at the cusp of making some really big discoveries yeah. because we're just getting to the point where we drilled enough sites where micro microbial studies have been carried out that we can start to see patterns and we can start to see trends and we can start saying, okay, this is really one of the key, key drivers of these communities. And that really is that variable that's not so important. Yeah. But, you know, to get to that point where you have a better, more complete understanding, you've just got to have a lot of data. And you've got to have a lot of data from, from disparate habitats. And we're not there yet. We're not even close. Yeah. You know, every expedition gives us more information to build on, but we just got to, we got, we got to keep pushing it and we've got to figure out a way the JR isn't replaced. You know, how, how, how's the community, how's the appetite for the community in terms of the science going to, going to be met? Yeah. If only there were some really mega rich billionaires with an interest in space kicking around, you know, <laughs> it seems like... There's so much money going into space, but not so much in terms of uh, understanding extreme environments and how that links together. I was talking to Don Walsh about this a couple of weeks ago. You know, I saw uh -huh. him in San Diego, you know, and he, he said to me, he said, you know, I told somebody back in the early 70s that the problem with lack of funding for deep sea research, it's public relations. We just aren't good marketers. We don't market what we do very well. And he's absolutely right. Hmm. You know, it's messaging and marketing. Yeah. And that's one of the great things about this podcast, because it gets a message out to way beyond the deep sea science community. And that's the kind of messaging that we have to work on, because we don't tend to self-promote very well. We don't do public relations, scientists. And we don't market, yep. you know, it's like the Chasing Coral movie and, you know, Richard Beavers, who's the British guy who did marketing for a career before he started working on coral reefs and got really interested in coral bleaching. And the success of that movie wasn't just the storytelling. It was the way that they, you know, they marketed the story and it made it so much more successful yeah. and compelling because it was, it was designed to be, the message was clear and concise. Yeah. And I think we could, we would be doing ourselves a big service if the deep sea science community would become more adept at science communication and learn a little bit of these skill sets that are involved in PR and marketing. I mean, I'm not talking about self-promotion. I'm talking about promoting the deep sea and the relevance of the deep biosphere and the relevance yeah. of the ocean because some of us do it. I mean, you you do it very well. Thank you. But most people don't do it well and we've got to all get better at it. Yeah, we, we've got projects running here and it's something we've discussed a lot on the podcast and something we've things we're writing about more and more is, is the language we use. It's not about me or whoever it is at the center of it. I mean, you've got to take the scientist out of the center of the story because, you know, you're, you're talking about the deep sea or a particular aspect of that. But other scientific disciplines probably have some of the same issues that we have. But certainly, I, I think the way we communicate deep sea science is really, really, truly awful. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just the wording's all wrong. It's always over sensationalized, but kind of in an empty way. It, you're right. It's the marketing. I think we need a almost a corporate take on it yeah. rather than just a bunch of people who who really like it and think everyone else should really like it too. And that's a really hard sell because most people have got other things going on in their lives. They don't care what happens in the deep sea. You know, they're trying to pay the rent. <laughs> they just want, you know, a, a, an easy time. And, and and that's very, very difficult. And I always, you know, going back to the space thing, I remember being in, and I, I was involved in an underwater neutrino telescope project back in the day, and they're looking for neutrinos and so on. And they were asking for sums of money, which were orders of magnitude greater than the entire budget for environmental science. And they were getting it. And in terms of usefulness to the average person, I would say they were orders of magnitude less yeah. useful to the average person. But they knew how. 
they just knew how to sell it. And it was it came down to nothing other than that. Joe Bloggs on the street probably doesn't really care that much where the Galactic Center is. <laughs> it's not going to change his life if it gets found out tomorrow. But yeah, the check that was written to find it, oof, that was, you know, eye-watering sums of money. But it's, it, yeah, it's, it's marketing. And, I, and one of the things that I think is... Like when you talk about the big drilling projects and how they all pull together and things like astrophysics and how they all pull together and there are other disciplines that do the same thing. In marine science, we tend not to. Yeah. It feels very fragmented. It feels lots of little people all doing lots of little bits. It's something we just haven't really done culturally. Yeah, but I do wonder whether if the deep sea community did bond the way that, you know, the astrophysics community does, if, if they have this big idea and they want to put a new telescope up or, or a new mission mm. to wherever, you know, they get together and they work together and they come up with a really powerful marketing message of relevance to NASA or whoever. And, you know, they get these obscene amounts of money to do these these projects. And I think part of the reason that the deep sea community doesn't do that is because there are no obscene pools of money for us, right? A big grant is a couple million dollars. I can't even imagine a 50 or a hundred million dollar project. Can you? I mean, I mean, I mean, I can, I, I could easily no. spend that much money, but where would you even go? My pen would run out of ink before I finished writing that number down. Yeah. That's how poor totally. we are. But it's like, you know, <laughs> if there were pools of money that size available, even $10 million, I guarantee guarantee you yeah. the community would come together and build teams that would compete with really exciting yeah. ideas if large pools of money were were available but they're just not great well on on that rather sad note let's well upon the fact that deep biosphere is absolutely totally truly and utterly fascinating and it really does <laughs> melt my head in terms of temperature pressure oxygen time scales that really does get me but in the meantime mandy joe it's been an absolute joy speaking to you today and thanks very much for your time thanks alan it was great to be here really enjoyed it No, I thought it was cool. I thought the whole interterrestrial thing was fascinating. I've never heard that term before. It's a great word. I love it. And so if you find something living underground on another planet, extraterrestrial, interterrestrial, right? Yeah. No, I like that. No, I thought it was really interesting. I mean, I've dabbled in not actually doing any science on it, but for about 10 years ago, we were looking at high pressure, high temperature test facility, and I was looking into all the oil wells and stuff like that, and I never really appreciated until I looked into it that how hot the oil is when it comes out of the ground. And yeah. The pressure that these things are living at is just astronomical. It's just, it's just it really... I mean, I guess it is bacteria, and then we're not looking at big multicellular animals, but at the same time, it's like it's amazing that biology is still happening in environments like that. It's the timescales that get me. It's that these things are barely call them alive. It's like a clock that ticks every hundred years. It's like one yeah. little biological process just ticks over every hundred years. And that's, it's, I don't know, when you like properly embrace evolution and the ways that a life has spread, like it doesn't have to make sense. It just has to work. It doesn't have to have a reason. Like the, the first thing your brain does when you hear about that is like, well, why? Why live like like that and it's just that yeah. because it works if there's any opportunity for for life to persist if there's any system that works it te it just does it and it doesn't have to make sense and it doesn't have to have a plan or be heading in a particular direction it's just life perpetuates wherever it can find a little foothold in weird ways it's brilliant i think generally speaking people who go down to anything smaller than myofauna when you get down to nematodes and the archaea and the bacteria and stuff like that there's people of a certain disposition because it's difficult. I mean, I've always said that I don't really understand anything that I can't drill a hole through and that, that works. Listen to Mandy talking about this stuff, you just like, I don't, I don't know how she does it, I don't know where you even start with that and how you're sort of sitting in, in your garden of an evening contemplating something that doubles every thousand years. <laughs> it's like in, it's just ecology in a hole. It's, it, it is one of those things, people talk about animals in the deep sea being alien-like and all this kind of stuff, which is just a lot of rubbish but when you get into that, it's like they're living in a different planet because the time scale do not sync with anything else no, we've got no foothold to sort of understand these things yeah. like i just imagine everyone who studies these just spends a lot of time staring into the night sky or just having like full-on existential crises there's one, there's one thing i meant to ask her that i forgot you didn't interview she kept talking about things like asgards and lokis and there's a whole bunch of like yeah there's a naming convention around it isn't there fascinating anyone listening who knows about that if they can like tweet in or message in like i'd really there's obviously been a naming convention agreed on and i quite like it when there's like themes to things so uh yeah fill us in on that there's obviously a, a norse mythology flavor going through oh it makes a change from the old greeks it's getting boring now and that concludes this episode of the deep sea podcast uh, like i mentioned at the start we now have a support us page to help keep the podcast going we've listed lots of ways of helping the show from the free like leaving a review or subscribing to becoming a patreon or buying our merch 
we've included some affiliate links on the page where you can shop online and we get a little small cut of those if you buy anything so check out the many ways that you can support the show by visiting our support us page on the website as i say we're going to try and make that as non-intrusive as possible but if we can get the show to be self-sustaining we just want to break even no one's going to get rich off this but if we can get the show to be self-sustaining hold on you told me we'd be millionaires by this time next month yeah i mean it's it's optimistic millionaires you said millionaires (laughs) we're two and a half years in now are we 34 episodes plus a load of bonuses yeah but for ages it were 30p and then we went up to 30p in a pint so what's the next level is millionaire right it's an exponential curve exponential growth we're seeing yeah that's true yeah anyway so give us your money or tom will go hungry i might have to fire him again to save some money yeah it's how you save the money when i'm actually working i'm hired but as soon as i stop we'll try and have a holiday it's like now you're fired now and then i get rehired at lower wage <laughs> <laughs> well, Stacey was better. She she works for stickers, you know? They're cheaper to produce than actual coins and money. Well, you know, that was meant to be just a funny joke. And then she was really, really good. <laughs> I thought it was it was a great it was a great intro. A hand on heart, mate. I thought she was better than you. I was thinking of maybe reinstating her and then fire you for the next month and see what happens. Yeah, I thought she was more approachable and more sort of polite, more enthusiastic, more articulate, more engaging. Yeah, just generally much more interesting person than you. So I don't know. I don't know. Don't disagree on that. She was good. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you want to fire yourself, if you want to, if you want to throw yourself on the sword for the greater good of Stacey, you feel free to do it. Well, I just want the sh- I want the show to be good, and if that means getting rid of me then you know so be it yeah it's all about the show mate so just out of curiosity how many stickers are we paying stacy three six six stickers six what oh, you're so cheap it's on there <laughs> what you said three <laughs> I just figured you were cheaper than that, but you're still really cheap, right? I've got to be honest, it was it, it was limited by the international postage. Is it not limited because that's that's all you've got left in the merch van? I've got I've got a few stickers on the go, but we only have three versions, so I thought like two of each seems good. All right, well, she lives she lives in California, doesn't she? She did. Next time I'm in California, I'll bring her a deep sea podcast apron because I think she deserves that for being better than you. But yeah, if you can get a picture, yeah. you and her and your matching aprons. It may be sooner than you think as well, so watch out, Stacey. <laughs> How big's California? Probably quite big. Oh, it's tiny, isn't it? It's just, there's San Diego and then there's like desert around it and that's it. All right. Well, there you go. He's coming for you. <laughs> and as you may have noticed, my sound quality isn't as good as usual. And that's because I am on the move at the moment. So sorry about that. It will be sounding lovely again at some point in the future, but maybe not by the next episode. I hope you're not driving an automobile or operating heavy machinery right now. <laughs> Both of the above. It feels like it's been an intense couple of weeks of driving heavy machinery and automobiles. I feel like you're sitting somewhere with a really naff orange hard hat on driving a massive digger and just digging a massive hole for no reason whatsoever. (laughs) And I've not been paying attention and there's like water and electricity and people are falling into it. Yeah, just gas blowing out of it, you know, just... uh... I'm after that deep biosphere. I want to get in on it. I want to see where the, where the action is. Yeah, literally, literally get in on it. Yeah, just take a massive hole and just jump right in. Yeah. And see, for science. <laughs> as long as you say that first. As long as you draw a graph, you can do whatever you like. Yeah, like biting into the glass sponge to cure COVID. <laughs> we should do this once a month. We just make a 10-minute episode of Tom doing stuff for science, like <laughs> biting in glass sponge or jumping into an unknown bacterial mat and just, just seeing what happens. Just science jackass. Yeah, deep sea jackass. And that concludes this episode, so we will deep see you next time, and we abyss you already. If you would like to advertise with the Deep Sea Podcast, feel free to get in touch. Our audience is primarily young people with an interest in science, often undergraduates or people considering a degree in marine science, but it also includes established scientists. Feel free to get in touch if you're interested in reaching these groups.